says, and I'm going to read quite a few verses so you get the context of what's going on, but I want you to uh, see this, this context. John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his dis disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Let me just pause right there. Can I say, there are a lot of people who don't have any common sense. How could a man sin before he's born? They said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? How could he sin before he's born? A little common sense. You know why so many preachers have to take heart medicine and acid reflux medicine? Because just like Jesus' disciples, there are people who don't have any common sense. But anyway, let's read on. Verse number 3, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seen. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received, my, and I received sight. Then say they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he'd received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others say, said, how can, a, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any uh, man did confess that he was Christ, he, would be put, or he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again, called they the man that was blind. How many kind of times are they going to ask this fellow? Uh, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then say they to him again, How did he, do, how did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, 
Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, uh, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Look at verse 20, 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you, Lord, for young people that will still make us stand. God, help us, Lord, to be concerned about spiritual things and heavenly things. Lord, we know your imminent return is at hand, and help us to do as you said there in the, in the scriptures. Uh, we must work uh, while it's day, for the nighttime cometh when no man can work. Help us to be busy about your business. Bless now the reading of the Word of God. Help us, Lord, tonight from the Word of God to convey what you would have us to convey. May it be received with gladness. Uh, and, Lord, may we all draw closer to thee. Save that one nearest hell and get glory to your name. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to show you a few things before we get to the message. First of all, I want you to notice the wandering. Look, if you will, in verse number 2. Again, his disciples ask him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Did you ever just wonder why something happened? Did you ever just wonder and, and talk to the Lord, what, what's going on in this situation? They are perplexed when they see this man sitting by the road begging, and they ask the Lord, Lord, why is he in this shape? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And we see the wondering. Now notice the why. Jesus is going to answer them. Sometimes Jesus answers our questions, our whys, and sometimes he don't. But here he does. Look what he says in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. What I take from this is, number one, we shouldn't judge anybody's situation. We don't know why they're in that situation. Until you walked a mile in their shoes, you shouldn't even have a commentary about their situation. Uh, we know he's in this situation. He's blind. Uh, and why, Jesus said, it wasn't because he sinned, uh, wasn't because his parents sinned, uh, but he was in this condition uh, uh, so that uh, 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 the works of God could be manifest in his life. Can I say this? Uh, he was a sufferer, not a sinner. Can I say there are some people who are not in their shape they're in because they're sinners, they're just suffering. Hmm? So we see the why. We see the wandering. Notice, if you will, the work. Look at verse 6. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made the clay of spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind uh, man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, uh, which is by interpretation sent. Uh, he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seen. We see Jesus done a work. Jesus used clay to restore the clay. Figure it out. Can I say sometimes in order... Uh, to affect humans, God uses humans. Hmm? In order to save somebody, God might send somebody with the gospel to save somebody. God uses natural things to do the supernatural. Hmm? God chose the base things uh, uh, to confound the wise, and he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Uh, but God chooses things like friendship and kinship, uh, and he uses clay to impact clay. Think about that. Now, notice something else I see in this. Uh, verse 7 is a picture of salvation. Look what happens. He heard, and he said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. The blind man heard that. Okay? And faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
He heard what Jesus said unto him. Friend, you didn't get saved till you heard what Jesus said unto you. Right. Till somebody presented the gospel to you and you heard the word of God. Uh, he heard. Uh, then notice, if you will, he acted in faith. Uh, he said, go wash in the pool slum. Uh, and then we find it says he went his way, therefore, uh, and washed. Uh, he acted in faith. Jesus said, go uh, and wash. Uh, he heard it. Uh, then he acted in faith. Uh, Brother Brian, it's one thing to hear the word of God. It's another thing to apply it, to act on it, uh, uh, to exercise faith uh, and put your faith and trust in the gospel, in the finished works of Calvary, uh, that Jesus died for your sins, uh, was buried and rose again uh, for your sins. Uh, and if you put your faith and trust in him, He'll save you from your sins. Uh, it's one thing to hear the gospel. It's another thing to believe. Right. He acted in faith. He heard it. He acted in faith. Uh, then he was washed. You didn't get saved till you got washed. Right. Uh, when you acted on faith to believe on the Lord, he washed you from your sins. Uh, and just as that song Brother James sang, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is now therefore no condemnation uh, unto them that walk in the Spirit. What a blessing to know. Uh, he not only washed me from my sins, uh, uh, my sins are gone, uh, and there is no more condemnation. Uh, I am a child of God. Uh, my sins will never be remembered anymore. Uh, we see that he heard, uh, he acted in faith, and he was washed. Uh, and then notice he could see. Nobody ever got to see till he got washed. And the old songwriter said, I once was blind, but now I see. Huh? Isn't it amazing how once you became a child of God, you could see clearly things that you never paid attention to before? Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, somebody reads the Bible, you couldn't understand a lick of it till you got saved. And all of a sudden, it makes perfect sense. Huh? Isn't it amazing? Uh, before you got saved, you'd hear people sing. You'd say, boy, they got a good voice. They're talented. But after they sing, you actually heard the message in the song. Right. Hey, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, after I got saved, the grass looked greener, the sky looked bluer, the birds sounded sweeter. Uh, why? Because I had been dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, but then I was made alive uh, by the Spirit of God. Uh, he quickened me. Everything looked better and sounded better. Because I could see. I was dead. It's kind of like kids Google this. It's kind of like when, when uh, 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 television shows went from black and white to color. Now, don't get me wrong. I still like some of them black and white shows. Can I say the acting was better? They didn't rely on special effects. They didn't rely on certain things that we have today, technical things. Back then, they had to act. But it's just like in The Wizard of Oz. It was in black and white, all of a sudden become color. Hmm? Uh, we see the work. We see he could see. What a blessing. But then from verses 12, and I'm not going to read all that again to verse 34, we see a warfare. There's people wondering whether or not he was the blind man, whether or not he'd ever been blind. You got parents worried about losing their seats in the synagogue, so they kind of disown him. You find uh, uh, constantly the Pharisees are looking to trip him up, looking to find fault in ways that they can uh, uh, cast doubt on Jesus. He healed on the Sabbath day. He did this. He did this. He's not of God. He's a sinner. And all and all and all. And then when the blind man who don't know anything calls them on it, boy, they got offended. Said, you're a sinner. How do you, you going to teach us? Uh, we see a warfare. Can I say, before you got saved, the devil had you right where he wanted you. But after you got saved, that's when the warfare started. See, he knows he can't have your soul, but he's going to mess with you because he doesn't want you to win anybody else to God. He wants to make you illegitimate in the eyes of your peers. Uh, can I say, he faced the wrath of the Pharisees, he saw the worry of his parents, he witnessed... Uh, 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 yet he witnessed of his pardon in verse 25 he said uh, 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 this, thing I want, uh, this one thing I know whereas I was blind now I see and, but he, he, he was found worthless of his peers they cast him out so we don't want to have anything isn't it amazing that folks who don't know God when they come into the presence of you once you trust God they feel threatened by you 
you're not threatening them, but you are a threat to them. Because if what you have is real, is an indictment of what they have. Right. Not real. Mm. Now, I want to get to where I want to get. Verse 38, I want you to read this verse. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. There was the wondering, the why, the work, the warfare, but here we find worship. I want you to notice this, and when I was reading this, this became so clear to me. His eyes had been opened in verse 7, but he hadn't worshipped. There's a lot of folks whose eyes have been opened, they've been saved, but they don't worship. Can I say in verse 25 he offered praise. He says, I once was blind, but now I see. But he hadn't worshipped. There are folks who will testify and say, I'm glad Jesus saved my soul, but they don't worship. There are folks on their jobs, there are folks in their family, they'll tell folks they're saved, they praise the Lord, but they don't worship. Shoot, you can watch ball players. They hit a home run, they'll praise the Lord, they'll do this, whatever that is. I don't think they're pointing to the stars. But they're not worshiping. You can go to Florence Freedom when they have their faith day and, and have a concert out there and hear praise. But it's not worship. That's why I quit going to Southern Gospel concerts. You'd have people from every denomination there and they'd say, let's have church. You can't have church. When we don't believe the same Bible, we don't believe the same gospel, we don't believe the same things, how can we worship except we be agreed? Hmm? Amen. You know, I always just went anyway as a form of entertainment. But when they start all that let's have church stuff, you can't have church in that atmosphere. They can have praise, but not worship. His eyes were open, but he hadn't worshiped. He offered praise, but he hadn't worshipped. Can I say this? He faced opposition. But he hadn't worshipped. You can face opposition from your family, from your co-workers, uh, 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 from people in the community. You can face opposition. That don't mean you've worshipped. So with all that on my, in mind, I'm reminded of John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, and in truth. With God's help, I'm going to preach on real worship tonight. Real worship. There's a lot of things called worship that doesn't have anything to do with worshiping God. There are people that worship relatives who have passed on. Uh, matter of fact, that's big in all the Eastern religions. They have little idols to their and altars to their loved ones who have died, and they worship their ancestors. There are people who worship sports figures. There are people who worship their jobs. There are people who worship little idols in their life. There's all kinds of things people worship, but it's not real worship. There are even people who come to church, but they don't worship. My dear friends, when we assemble, we assemble not to serve. This is worship. Service happens outside these doors. So what is real worship? Well, again, God is a spirit. and They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God who fills the heaven and the earth while pervading, governing, and upholding all things is an infinite spirit. He can be pleased only with that which resembles himself. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why do you think it said God is a spirit and we must worship him in spirit? It has to resemble him for it to be real worship. Uh, therefore, to worship him in spirit, uh, one must hate sin 
and sinfulness uh, and be a partaker of his divine nature. Uh, if you're not saved, you can't worship him. Uh, 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 listen, uh, worship is not contingent on our sincerity, but worship uh, uh, must be in truth under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Anything else in worship? Amen. Being sincere and giving a testimony in worship. Worship is when the Holy Ghost directs you to stand up and tell the truth of what God's done for you. Amen. There's a difference. Amen. So what is real worship? Well, real worship has fruit. And how to know the difference is whether or not the fruit's right. Hmm? Listen, how many of you have ever heard this? The Bible says you're not to judge, so you can't judge me. You ever heard that? The Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. That's what the Bible says. We know all judgment's been committed to Christ. He's the judge. And if you judge, guess who's going to judge you? The difference is Jesus judges. His motivation is holiness. Our judgment is subject to our own prejudices. Hmm? Now, we're not to be judges. But the Bible does say you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. Now, if I look at an apple tree and see it has apples, I know it's an apple tree. If I look uh, 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 down there in Florida and some of them groves and see these trees with oranges, I know they're an orange tree. Huh? You get it? We used to have cherry trees at our house, and Miss Nett cut them all down. But anyway, you can see them wild cherries growing on them. You know, they was cherry trees. Uh, 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 you can see the fruit, know what kind of tree it is. Now, to judge the fruit is a whole different thing. That means you cut it open, see if it's rotten. See, we, we're not giving that. But we are given the insight to know what kind of tree it is by the fruit that it produces. Can I say? Real worship produces certain fruit. Yes, and you'll see that fruit and you know it's real. Because can I say? The devil's a slick booger. Anybody believe that? Hmm? You know the Bible says he can be transformed into an angel of light. Hmm? You say, why would Samson fall for Delilah? Is because of the one who was pushing Delilah, who was the one inside of Del Delilah. Huh? Can I say? He can transform himself owing to look so much like God, right. but he's not God. And there are a lot of things called church, a lot of things that are associated with church, a lot of singing that is associated and will mention God, but it don't mean it's real. Amen. Hmm. I'm kind of like the Coca-Cola commercials of yesteryear. I want the real thing. Amen. Life's too short to settle for phony. Hmm. Phony baloney. Yep. And I'm not talking about Tony. <laughs> uh, just thought I'd throw that in. Hadn't picked on Brother Tony for a while, so there you go. Didn't want you mad at me. You know? But the truth of the matter is, a lot of people are sat satisfying for phony, thinking it's the real thing. And that's why you go home empty. That's why you get no help. That's why you get no strength. That's why there's no growth in your life. That's why your prayers aren't being answered. That's why you, uh, uh, the way of the Christian seems hard to you. Because what you're putting your faith in isn't real. What you're associating with isn't real. And what you're partaking of isn't real. It won't satisfy. Listen, anybody like me grow up when I had that powdered milk? Did you ever drink any of that junk? I can tell the ones that did, you're all going. It's not the real thing. Hmm? Uh, can I tell this story? It's going to embarrass somebody. I won't tell. I won't, I won't mention names. I'll never forget Miss Nett when she started doing Donut Sunday. She had a, a child in her classroom said, What kind of milk is this? 
So I got a Kroger's down there. Says, no, what kind is this? Because that kid's parents had never bought real milk. They bought the watered-down milk. It ruined that kid. I will mention names here. Years ago, some of y'all don't remember, but we used to kind of babysit Miss Wonderful. Whose girl are you? Brother Doug. <laughs> Miss Caitlin. That's when she became Brother Doug's girl. You know why? Because Josh and Tina had fed her Cheerios without sugar. She come to Brother Doug's house where it's sugar heaven. <laughs> Tina called up Annette, thanks a lot. She says, what? Caitlin won't eat Cheerios without sugar on them no more. <laughs> huh? Bella used to know where I carried the cho- kept the chocolate. Huh? We found her. We were looking for Bella one day. She got in the cupboard, closed the door. She's in there having herself a time <laughs> with fudge rounds. She ate a whole box of them. Huh? There's no substitute for the real stuff. You can eat instant potatoes, but you enjoy the real thing. Uh, I'm just trying to to help you tonight. There's a lot of things people are settling for. It's not the real thing. So what's the fruit of real worship? Can I say this? Real worship brings adoration. The very term worship refers to adoration. Total adoring of the Lord. If you come and you haven't really let him know how much you love him it's not real worship hmm? kind of like brother Bill Warnke whose pictures out there in the vestibule he used to say all the time well I told Eloise I loved her the day we got married well if you don't tell your spouse on a regular basis how much she means to you and how much you love her and how thankful you are for her you think she's going to appreciate you or she'll know how much you appreciate her? Well, if we don't constantly tell him how, how much we love him for what he's done for us, do you think he thinks we appreciate him? But yet we'll tell everything else how much we think about them? Hmm? It brings adoration. Chambers said this, Worship is the love offering of our keen sense of worship of God. Our worship is how much our worship is of Him. How much is He worth to us? It is a love offering to Him for us showing Him what He is worth to us. It brings adoration. Hmm? What is Jesus worth to you? Where would you be without Him? A lot of us already be in hell. You do know that, don't you? Uh, but see, when you truly worship there will be fruit of how much you adore him now I got a real problem with folks that before church all they talk about is worldly things while they're in church their mind's about worldly things they're filling out their shopping list and all kinds of other stuff and then after church all they talk about worldly things and nowhere in the equation do you hear anything about how much they love him if I see that what do you think he sees because he knows the intents of your heart. Can I say there will be adoration? That is a fruit you will see of real worship. Hmm? Listen, when you fell in love with your spouse, everybody knew it. That's all you talked about. How beautiful she is, or how handsome he is, or how funny he is, or how he makes you feel, and all that kind of... How come we don't talk about Jesus that way? Because we've gotten over our first love. That's the first fruit of worship. Adoration. Can I say real worship will produce appreciation? Hmm? Worship is giving back to God our very best unreservedly. There is a sense of thankfulness to where we show that appreciation so much. How come when we have a good meal, we have no problem putting a tip down to our server, but we have a real problem telling the Lord that we appreciate what He's done for us? Hmm? 
real worship, real worship will produce fruit of adoration, but also fruit of appreciation. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for somebody that isn't thankful when somebody's been good to them. Nobody's been as good to you as Jesus has. Hmm. Hmm. I have a preacher friend of mine. If he has a preacher in and the preacher doesn't send him a thank you card or a thank you note, he never has him back. If he has a missionary in and the missionary doesn't send him a thank you note, he doesn't even pray about taking him on for support. He said, if they can't appreciate the goodness of God's people, then they don't appreciate God. When's the last time you gave God a thank you note? Hmm? When's the last time you told Him how appreciative you are of watching over you, providing for you, taking good care of you, healing you, healing your loved ones, hearing your prayers. We could go on forever and then bring it all to a climax for saving you. See, we forget what garbage dump he found us in. We forget how our life was spiraling out of control or where our life would be without him. See, real worship brings adoration, it brings appreciation, but it also brings abasement. This fellow here said to the Lord, tell me who he is that I might believe. Verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. You know what that means? That he fell down before him prostrate and worshipped him. Can I say, true worship, only happens when we find verse 38. Notice the wording. Well, I read this, it jumped off the page at me. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Can I say that only when he exercised faith was he able to worship. And you and I don't worship unless we exercise faith. And as long as we can come in and sit down, get up, sing the songs that will be sung, uh, uh, listen and sit there and do nothing, we will not have worship. Real worship is when we exercise faith. Lord, I believe. And then he worships. In a few minutes, we'll give an invitation. If you really believe what is being preached, you'll worship. Because you'll exercise faith. But if you don't exercise faith, it's not worship. Say, preacher, where do you get that? Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Mm -mm. Listen, one writer said this, faith brings me into personal contact with God before whom I must ever bow. See, without faith, you don't have that personal connection with Him. Because without, when, when you don't exercise faith, you're exercising what you know, or logic. And God's not impressed with what you know, or with your logic trying to figure it out. What touches God's heart is when you can't figure it out, and you still believe. Hmm? Can I say this? Real faith brings adoration, brings appreciation, brings abasement, humility. It also brings activity. If you worship, there'll be works that go along with that. People say, well, I'll worship on the lake. No, you won't. Well, I'll worship in private. No, you won't. Every act of worship is a public testimony. It is presenting to God heartfelt gratitude for all that He's done for us publicly, not privately. This fellow right here did it publicly. We don't know how many was hanging around outside the synagogue. We know Jesus' disciples were there. We do know that He said, Lord, I believe, and He worshipped Him publicly. He didn't say, Lord, let's go off into a corner somewhere. Don't tell me that you worship privately. If you don't worship him publicly, I guarantee you, you don't do anything privately with him. 
But can I say, every act of worship has some activity. Can I say, giving is a form of worship. That's a form of worship. Worship is a verb. It is an action word. There has to be some action or activity that goes along with it. Giving. Praising. All of those are activities. Witnessing. All those are activities. When you worship, there will be works. I really wrestle, Brother Clint, for folks that say they've been saved for 30 years, and outside of sitting on a church pew, you never see anything that associates salvation with them at all. You never ever hear of them inviting anybody to church. You never hear people, out of them, thank God they come to church, but you just never see anything out of them. They may be saved, but they don't know anything about worship. If you worship, something's going to come out in your life. There'll be some open display of how much Jesus means to you. Hmm. To quote, quote an old phrase, you, you put your money where your mouth is. There's just something about it. Yes. Folks that worship, you know they're one of His. Hmm? Throughout the book of Acts, throughout the, the Gospels, anytime somebody worshiped Jesus, everybody knew it. You ever hear about that alabaster box? She didn't care how many people were there. She worshiped. And the whole room knew it. Hmm? And can I say, throughout the Bible, when they worshipped him, there was a crowd around, and they didn't care. And people knew it. Hmm? Worship brings activity. Can I say this? Real worship brings assurance. Contentment. Hmm? When you worship him, he's pleased with your worship, and that's all you need. When you know that Jesus is pleased with you, Nothing else matters. And when he's pleased with you, you get a peace, a contentment that this world can't give. Hmm. There's been times when I've had to make stands that have hair-lipped the devil. If you're hair-lipped, I'm sorry, that's not a good term, but I used it anyway. Anybody hair-lipped? Okay, good. There have been times when I've stood when there are people that I've went to church with in the sanctuary have stood up and cussed me. There have been times when I've had to make a stand when the service was over, people would rally around me and they would call me everything but what I am. They didn't gnaw on me and gnash on me with their teeth like they did Stephen, but they might as well have. But can I say, in every instance, Miss Noreen, I had such peace, it didn't matter what they did. Trust me, it had to be of the Lord. Because you're not going to cuss me outside of church, let alone inside of church, that I'm not going to pop off the mouth and if nothing else. But not to even utter a word in defense, because I had peace that only God could give. Matter of fact, I didn't even hear them. People had to tell me about it afterwards. When the buzzards were around me, absolutely raking me over the coals, I didn't see Jesus standing at the right, Father's right hand, but I might as well had, because I had such contentment. See, when you really worship, it doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. There's contentment. There is such peace that this world can't even describe what comes over you. It's just called the touch of God. Real worship brings assurance. It'll let you know you're headed the right direction. You're in the right vein. Everything's going to be okay. Huh? My family's learning a song. We're going to sing it. 
I've been singing it to myself for over a year, but it talks about Peter in prison. And we know the end of the story, how the church had been not ceased praying for him, how the angel comes and gets him out. But before the angel came and got him out, Peter's he, he don't know, he, he thinks he's going to the chopping block the next day. But this song talks about even in the midst of his storm, he could think back about when the Lord come walking on the water. And he realized, the Lord's got this. And Peter went to sleep. You really think you could go home, go to sleep, if you knew in the morning your head's coming off your body? How'd that happen? Assurance. Where does assurance come from? Worship. Yeah. Hmm. Got one last thing. I, I preached much longer than I thought I would. Real worship brings the fruit of award. God openly rewards them who openly worship Him. I won't take time to read it, but you'll find the next few verses, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and lets them know they're still in their sin. But this man isn't because he worshiped the Lord. And can I say, when you truly worship the Lord, the Lord rewards you openly. Do you ever see somebody that just seems like everything they touch turns, to, they're like Midas, turns to gold? Seems like they can do no wrong. Seems like they're always blessed. They're always excited. They're always happy. They're, you know why? Because they worship. And the Lord blesses them. Now, I've got news for you. They've got problems. They've got troubles. they got just like you, but the only, problem, the only difference is their troubles and their problems don't have them. Because hmm? they're going to worship God regardless. You worry, they worship. God openly rewards those who openly worship Him. And the reason you see the fruit of the touch of God in their life is because they've learned to worship. I said all that to say this. You want to see our church really make an impact in this community? Let's really start worshiping. Let's quit trying to worship. Let's quit giving the appearance of worship. Let's worship. Here's how you know if you're worshiping or not. If you're concerned about what everybody else thinks about you, you're not worshiping. If you're concerned that everybody's taking notice of you, you're not worshiping. If you're wanting credit or attention, you're not worshiping. But if it's to the point where it's just you and the Lord in the room and nobody else, can, you might be into something. Huh? If you're contingent on how you appear before people, you're not worshiping. But if you get to the point where you don't give a rip what anybody thinks, but you want to make certain he knows what you think, you might be into something. God help us to quit playing and really start praying and worshiping the Lord. God help us to really come to the house of God to give Him the due that He deserves. Because that's what this sanctuary is for. It's an oasis for us to come and hear truth and to worship Him by allowing the truth to affect us to where we resemble Him and we are in a position to where we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you've got too much of the world hanging off of you, you're not going to worship. If this week the world's got more of your attention than Him, you're not going to worship. If all you can think about is anything but Him, you're not going to worship. God help us to have real worship. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While he's picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do bless you. Thank you for insight and truth. Lord, help us to believe the word of God. 
act upon the word of God and help us, Lord, to truly adore you and appreciate you and worship you. For without you, Lord, we would be nothing. God, we sure do bless you. Thank you for your providence in our lives. Thank you for the pardon you granted, the peace that you give, the help and hope that you are for our hearts and our lives. Lord, we're without excuse not to worship you. You're worthy of our praise. God, so many times you become an afterthought instead of the foremost thought. Forgive us of that. Help us, Lord, to truly learn what it is to worship you, that others might see fruit of worship in our lives, that they might fall under condemnation and conviction and come to trust in you as well. Bless now this invitation. Lord, speak to hearts. You know who needs to move and what folks need to do. So God, speak to hearts. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.